And just a disclaimer that non-duality isn't for all. Um, yeah. I say that as a disclaimer, but um, I don't know how how exactly to phrase that correctly. So, yeah, it's just really not for all. It's not therapy. It's not about making your personal self have a better experience. Well, that, that can be a side effect. It's not about helping you have better relationships, although that can be a side effect. Yeah. Um, it's not about uh, changing your emotions, although that can be a side effect. But sometimes people come to non-duality to try to have a happier person. And it's really about going beyond the person. And that misunderstanding can cause people, you know, a lot of difficulties along the path because they're not being honest with themselves. And um, and they're kind of then confronted with a subject which, in some ways, when you don't I really understand the subject, negates the person. So if you have trauma, you know, you need to go to a trauma specialist. On my website, I've got um, recommendations of different people you can work with, but it's not limited to that. There's so much if you look on the internet and practices you can do. Yeah, so the reason that I picked this title was actually because I saw on Osborne's channel um, a, a, a video of me speaking 10 years ago um, about gurus. And yeah, since that time, I've changed my mind slightly. But I'm also more educated on narcissism and psychology so there's an understanding of it better and you know what I was seeing and averse to back then yeah but I'm also a woman now when I look at that video I was like a girl still <laughs> I know it sounds weird but yeah there was still like growing up I mean, maybe we we're always growing up, but I just look at it and feel like I was still a girl, whereas now I feel very like a woman, a woman. Whatever that is. So yeah, if you haven't seen it, you can go to Osborne's channel and it's something like, it's named something like, I'm disgusted when teachers put themselves out as gurus, something like that's the title of it. Yeah, so it's really interesting to have these 12 years documented for me, like, so being on the internet for 12 years and being able to look back at 10, 11, 12, seven years ago, and then the changes that evolve. Um, 
And it's also humbling as well. Like, uh, yeah, to see myself being opinionated about something which I don't really hold opinions about anymore. I don't know if you have experienced that in your life. Maybe you don't put yourself on YouTube speaking every week for 12 years, so you don't experience that. But uh, yeah, it's interesting thing to do. Um, so... Pardon me. Sorry, I still do that, 12 years on. Um, so in the video, I was very reactive about the idea of a guru. And I think I even said something like the monkey sitting at the front, trying to be the top monkey, something like this. Um, yeah. Yeah, now my opinion has changed. It's the same in the sense that um, most people um, view the guru in the wrong way. So they see the guru as the form, as the skin, as the hair, as the eyes, as the nose, as the words, as the character, as somebody that's inside the body. And when you view the guru in that way, then you totally miss the guru. So when you personify or personalize a guru, you miss that guru. You're not really seeing the guru, you're seeing your projection of the guru. So to really um, meet your guru, you have to meet yourself first. Otherwise, it will be a human exchange and it will be about you trying to get something off the guru and you holding the guru up to standards, to ideas, to beliefs, and then knocking them down when they don't. Meet those standards, ideas, and beliefs. So to really meet your guru is to meet yourself. And some people at first need a teacher in order to project or not project, to illuminate that. So some people on the Bhakti path, they can see the freedom in the guru, but they can't see it in themselves. So then there is a, um, a uh, yeah, transference that happens or a um, seeing beyond. Um, yeah, that can be really beautiful and effective for people. To recognize themselves externally, their true self externally. But to believe it's actually that person that's doing it. It's actually that person that's making it happen. 
is missing the point. So what you're seeing in the guru is non-duality, not two-ness. And the guru is a mirror, mirror for that. But it's your own t- not two-ness. It can only ever be your own not two-ness. This is so pure and so beautiful. But it's really not them doing it. You know, we put it up there, it's this master or that master, it's their energy, but whose energy? It can only be your energy, because everything is made of you. Everything is made of pure being, which is what you are. And I know that doesn't make sense when there seems to be many. It's the most sensical thing there is. Everything is pure being. So the teacher or the guru may appear in the dream only as a mirror. And then when you go beyond the vision, you'll see that everything is the guru. The leaves, the sky, the tree, the wind, the others. Everything is the guru. And that is love, total and utter love. It's all you've ever wanted. So, yeah, I think this is really beautiful. And I think this is like a a letting go of, or I don't even know if it's a letting go or a changing of ideas from back then. But I think I would have said these types of things in other videos. But I think there was also a rejection of gurus because of my experience of Western gurus. I feel like in India, it's a different system that us Westerners can't really understand. And a guru in India is kind of in this system, which is very different in the West, like society, their society supports gurus and ashrams in a way, whereas our society doesn't. And yeah, I've just found a lot of the time in the West, there can be narcissistic abuse happening. So the guru is actually a narcissist and um, they, you know, they run an organization that is kind of taking advantage of people and exploiting people. Yeah, and that's really sad that that's the experience in the West, but I think it's because we don't have all the safeguards and we don't really understand the meaning of guru. And we're not educated in narcissism to see it. So somebody like Ananda Mahima, who lived in India last century, and she was a um, considered herself a guru. Like I just don't. She I just she just didn't take. I mean I don't know, but it just doesn't seem like there was taking advantage of people. Like there was nothing that she needed from people in a way. Like she sort of lived a bit like a sadhu and roamed a lot around the country, even though everywhere she roamed to, she'd sometimes be by herself, but she was often in her ashrams. But um, yeah, I don't feel like there was narcissism or abuse that happened in any way. She was just doing the job of acting as a mirror for people. And I think there's lots of lots of gurus that are like that. But I just think in the West, because they're very isolated and nobody really knows what it is, 
it's like what tends to arise in the west in the west is like um is these very narcissistic characters you know it's not like that the society finds the guru like they did in um in ananda mahima like people just kept coming to her or the same with satguru it's more that they sort of create Maybe there is, in some circumstances, a creating of an organization around them and they're not involved in it, but it often is. And it's just my experience when I've been in these organizations as a seeker and then also as not a seeker, there's often things like, for example, like one organization that I knew um, what they often really encouraged is for you to give them all your money and your house and then you could live with them for the rest of your life and they would look after you. And that, I can understand how somebody could sell that as a really beautiful thing, like you give up all your worldly responsibilities. But then because the society doesn't, because society doesn't have this in the culture, there's no way out for that person. So they go in they give away all their property, their money, their livelihood. And I'm sure there's great liberations and awakenings that happen. But then if they want to come out, they've got no way of coming out because the society doesn't understand. Often like they've ostracized their family. They don't have any friends left. And then they've given the money to the organization. So yeah, this, it's just a different thing in the West. Um, and also in that organization that I'm speaking of, from my understanding, the teacher also took a new female student like every two years. I can was dating them for two years and then we'll move on to another one. And they all saw that as really beautiful and a really profound thing. But it's just also there's There's a reason why they, you know, have, a, I know it's not always the way in India, but why they have this, um, like, tending to be, tending, what's that word called, you know, when they don't have sex? Yeah, because, um, because it just really complicates things. You know, if somebody is traumatized sexually, then... When a powerful person comes onto them, and this is particularly of women, but it can be the other way around. When a powerful person comes onto them or a leader of a group comes onto them, they can't say no, they go into fight or flight mode. And then also the pressures of the whole group and everyone seeing it as a good thing. There's, there's like, um, and then not being able to get out of the group. I can see all these danger zones. For some people, though, being in that group, I had amazing stories. I mean, this is the non-black and whiteness. Like, pe people went in there with, like, severe depression where they couldn't get out of bed, they couldn't do anything, and then they completely um, transformed and, like, got over their depression and they, they're the happiest they've ever been. So it's not black and white. I can see all the multicolors of it now. I was maybe less so 12, 10 years ago with the other video. Yeah. But the most important part is realizing the teacher or the guru is a mirror. It's not them that's doing anything. They are a mirror because everything is the pure being. Everything. So when you see God in them, and when you practice seeing God in them, it's seeing God in yourself because beingness is everywhere and all things. Because who is you and who is the teacher? And then the next thing to confront in all these ideas 
is this idea of you going to a guru to become enlightened. I'm not saying that you don't do spiritual practices. I think I make it quite clear that I'm not against spiritual practices. I think that they can really settle down on the person. But that person isn't the one that's going to wake up. It's the pure beingness that comes forward. And that pure beingness isn't a thing. And it's not under your control. It's not you that decides you'll wake up or not. So you think that you're doing the spiritual practice to get somewhere. But life is orchestrating you to do the spiritual practice. And when it wants to reveal itself, it will with or without the spiritual practices. That doesn't mean don't do them. If that's what life's orchestrating, you know, that's what needs to happen. There was spiritual practice here and in most teachers, and in most people that wake up. So do you need a guru to become enlightened? I looked up before what guru meant, but I've forgotten. So I just have to, it's a, it really interesting, the two words. Guru. <laughs> um, Yeah, I don't know if I can find it quickly again. I think it's like one part is knowledge or wisdom. The word guru, teacher. Yeah, I don't know if I can find the exact meaning of guru. Quickly, but um, um yeah, so we just leave that. I think it's something like dispelling of darkness or something like that. The dispelling of darkness. Um, that might be wrong. Um, it is dispeller of darkness. Yeah, somebody just wrote and said dispeller of darkness. But I think there's different interpretations but I think it's dispeller of darkness yeah and do you need a guru in order to become enlightened I mean do you need the dispeller of darkness darkness meaning the ego and yes you need the dispeller of darkness but it is yourself that is the dispeller of darkness it's not something outside of you. So what might appear in the dream is a person that appears as a guru or a person that appears as a teacher. But it's only, that's your being. That's you. So it's your own dispelling of darkness. It's so beautiful. So yes, you need it, but it's yourself. <laughs> it's not someone out there. It's just that someone in the dream might appear as the teacher or the guru. The illusion always is that there is somebody inside your body interacting and navigating 
undoing and acting separately from something outside, but when you truly know yourself as the pure being or what you are, which is no thing and everything, seemingly perceiving itself, experiencing itself as pure being or love, then you see that everything was your guru, the whole way. There was nothing that wasn't the pure being, the dispeller of darkness. Nothing. Osborne's, I just read Osborne's. I have to admit that I chose that title for that video a bit to see how the, the um, clicks responded that he's talking about the video of disgust. I disgusted about gurus. I mean, I did actually say it in the video. I watched it myself. And the video quickly got a lot of views more than usual. People thought the clip was funny and a lot of positive comments. I mean, this is another thing that when you're not a YouTube creator, you don't really understand how YouTube's functioning. And YouTube is having such a huge effect on our society and our current way of thinking is that in order to like get good views, you have to pick really shocking and dramatic titles. Like, so you, YouTube, and the way the algorithm works is it's much about titles. So you get your screen and you're looking across and then a title grabs you and then you click on it. And, um, and so a lot of the competition is about titles in YouTube. And it's, it's like an interesting thing that forms because then it's like the more and more shocking or grotesque the title is, shocking, good or bad, the more views it will get and the more popular it will become. And then the other YouTubers will have to compete against that. So it's a really interesting thing and I'm not judging it. Like, um, I feel happy when I see other non-duality teachers doing it because the more they do it, the more the non-duality gets out into the world. But it's also... The people that are empathetic, it's always the way. It's very, it's a bit difficult for them always to engage in creating and competing with these sorts of things. But um, but yeah, if you can see it as the positive of like getting non-duality more out into society, then it's easier to do. But yeah, it was a sweet video. I watched it and I was a little shocked by the strongness of some of the opinions in there, but also just the sweetness as in, it feels like the same thing, even though it's different 10 years later, 11 years later, it's different the way I speak about it. It's, um, yeah, sweet. I find that sweet. Yeah, and it's really interesting to play around with um, the titles. And I have to admit, I copy titles from other people because I often can't think of them. And because I look to see which one I think is interesting to talk about and which other people will be interested in. So I sometimes make up my own, but often I can't think about it. So I just put in non-duality or I put in a subject and see what videos come up and then quickly grab a title. That's how I do it. 